Good morning. Chers et chers collègues, please take your seats. I call the meeting of the General Committee on Democracy, Human Rights and Humanitarian Questions to order. The agenda for this meeting has been distributed. Can I invite you to adopt the agenda? Any objections? I don't see any. Thank you. The agenda is adopted. This morning, we will continue to consider the amendments to the, to the supplementary items and discuss the su supplementary items. Yesterday, we completed our work. No, no, no. Um, we start uh, with the second item, uh, which is under the title Neonatal Care as a Social Development Target. There are three amendments to this item. E adesso invito la senatrice Taverna d'Italia di presentare sua proposta. Grazie Presidente. Signor Presidente, gentili colleghi, cari amici, è un onore essere qui e avere l'opportunità di presentare questa proposta di risoluzione sul tema della cura neonatale quale obiettivo di sviluppo a livello sociale. Quella che oggi vi presento è una battaglia che porto avanti da molto tempo e che credo sia meritevole dell'attenzione di questa importante Assemblea. Ma prima di entrare nel merito della mia proposta, permettetemi di ringraziare sentitamente tutti coloro che hanno reso possibile la presentazione di questo documento. Innanzitutto ringrazio la famiglia Osce, di cui sono fiera di far parte, per l'attenzione e la sensibilità mostrata sin da quando ho iniziato a lavorare su questo tema. È la prima volta che partecipo alla, ses alla sessione dell'Assemblea parlamentare e ho davvero apprezzato il sostegno e l'aiuto di tanti colleghi. E sono tanti i colleghi che vorrei ringraziare, non li elenco tutti per non fare torto a nessuno. Vorrei solo citare per un ringraziamento speciale per i consigli e l'appoggio la collega Heidi, Heidi Fry del Canada che tutti conosciamo e stimiamo. Ripeto però, grazie anche a tutti gli altri colleghi con i quali ho parlato in queste settimane e in questi mesi. E grazie anche ai colleghi che hanno fatto proposte di emendamento, dando un contributo al dibattito e all'approfondimento del testo. Vorrei dire ora alcune parole sul senso di questa mia proposta di risoluzione. La cura neonatale che in questa prospettiva diventa strumento di sviluppo a livello sociale. Nell'ambito della cura neonatale da tempo ho fatto dello screening neonatale esteso un mio personale impegno mettendo il mio paese, l'Italia, insieme a tanti altri paesi europei e non europei in questo campo. Adesso il traguardo più ambizioso è quello di diffondere il più possibile una cultura dello screening neonatale a livello internazionale allo scopo di portare benefici effettivi a moltissime persone e per farlo peraltro sarebbero necessarie poche risorse. In concreto che cos'è lo screening neonatale? Attualmente è nota una lunga serie di malattie genetiche metaboliche curabili. La diagnosi precoce, parliamo delle prime ore di vita, permette al neonato di evitare conseguenze permanenti e invalidanti e in molti casi consente di scongiurare addirittura la morte. Sottolineo che parliamo esclusivamente di malattie curabili, non stiamo parlando di patologie genetiche per le quali ancora non è nota una cura e la cui conoscenza involontaria creerebbe situazioni complicate da gestire per la persona e per i familiari. Penso ad esempio al morbo di Huntington. Ecco, in questi casi la diagnosi precoce non si può fare. L'esame viene effettuato solo su bambini già nati e anche questo, come sapete, è importante, mai sul feto. E non esiste alcuna controindicazione all'effettuazione del test. Bastano infatti poche gocce di sangue prelevate dal tallone. A fronte di questa piccola operazione il beneficio è immenso e riguarda moltissimi attori, diversamente ma significativamente coinvolti nel processo. 
Il neonato evita conseguenze irreversibili come disabilità o morte. La famiglia del bambino e lo Stato non vengono gravati dagli oneri connessi alle cure che immancabilmente derivano da una condizione di non autosufficienza se non di totale disabilità. Sottolineo che quando parlo di famiglia mi riferisco in particolare alle donne, sulle quali nella maggior parte dei casi purtroppo ricade il compito della cura di un membro della famiglia disabile. Ma in molti casi è una responsabilità condivisa tra uomini e donne, spesso coinvolge gli altri figli e gli altri membri della famiglia. Quanto alle donne molte volte sono costrette ad annullare qualsiasi altro aspetto della loro vita, a cominciare dal lavoro, per dedicarsi totalmente e permanentemente alla cura del figlio disabile. Ma oggi, grazie alle moderne tecnologie, esiste la possibilità di diagnosticare più di 40 patologie genetiche e metaboliche rare e, come ho detto prima, tutte curabili e fa male pensare che possano esserci bambini destinati a rimanere disabili a vita o peggio a morire solo perché non hanno avuto la fortuna di nascere nella parte giusta del mondo, in questo caso in un luogo dove sia già arrivata la cultura e la pratica dello screening neonatale. Credo davvero che l'area OSCE sia lo spazio ideale per unire le forze a livello internazionale nell'intento di creare una sensibilità comune e diffondere la cultura e la pratica dello screening neonatale, quale importante strumento di prevenzione di malattie e allo stesso tempo di sviluppo sociale, perché come giustamente ha detto l'Organizzazione Mondiale della Sanità, bisogna lavorare sulle condizioni di salute dell'infanzia per consentire a tutti di dare il loro miglior contributo alla società. Per quanto riguarda in particolare gli stati dell'OSCE che come membri dell'Unione Europea mi piacerebbe che si arrivasse alla creazione di un quadro normativo armonico che fosse capace di garantire un diritto allo screening neonatale esteso applicato in modo uniforme su tutto il territorio dell'Unione Europea. Più in generale vorrei sottolineare l'importanza e penso davvero di incontrare il consenso di tutti coloro che si trovano in quest'Aula di dare un segnale piccolo ma importante nel senso di valorizzare il diritto alla salute come fattore che contribuisce alla stabilità sociale e influisce sulla sicurezza regionale. Cari colleghi, mentre preparavo questo intervento ho trovato una bella citazione di Eleanor Roosevelt. Il futuro appartiene a coloro che credono nella bellezza dei propri sogni. Ognuno di noi, pur venendo da esperienze diverse, svolge il suo mandato di parlamentare perché crede alla bellezza del proprio sogno. Faccio parte di un giovane movimento in Italia, di cui forse qualcuno di voi avrà sentito parlare, il Movimento 5 Stelle. Sul piano dei rapporti tra gli Stati e dei rapporti tra i popoli, il Movimento 5 Stelle si propone di dare un contributo alla costruzione di una comunità internazionale più giusta e più attenta ai bisogni delle persone. Sono certa che è un obiettivo che unisce tutti noi parlamentari e membri dell'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE. Posso dire sul piano personale che la mia esperienza di quest'anno nell'Assemblea parlamentare dell'OSCE, questa esperienza fatta di dialogo e scambio di idee sincero, costruttivo e mai solo formale, mi dà molta fiducia e molta speranza per il futuro. Grazie per l'attenzione. Le ringrazio. Chers e chers colleghi, Now we have on the speakers list two speakers. I will pass the floor to the first speaker and after the intervention of the first speaker, I will close the speakers list. The floor now goes to Mr. Dalival from Canada and is getting ready Mr. Wachowski from the Holy See. Please, Mr. Dalival. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I want to thank Senator Tavarna of Italy uh, for bringing this resolution forward. Uh, being Dr. Fry sitting to my right and, uh, and my elder daughter, uh, Kirit, uh, being a fellow in neonatology, uh, this supplementary item on the neonatal care is of great importance to me. And this is a topic that is talked around our dinner table on, almost on a regular basis. Uh, Madam Speaker, as, as we know, the concept of security extends beyond traditional military security. The OSCE 
takes a comprehensive security approach, which includes the political, military, the economic, and the environment, and the human dimensions. The objectives laid out in this item on neonatal screening respect the human security objectives of the OSCE. Neonatal screening can help countries to achieve the sustainable development goals, targets on newborn and under five mortality. Human security is central to achieving sustainable development goals include disease, hunger, poverty, violence, and repression. These issues must be addressed if we are to fully embrace a comprehensive security approach at the OSCE. Therefore, while health policy may be the first thing that comes to mind when considering security, in fact, that might not be the case, but I believe that such issues have an important place in the debates of the OSCEPA. As Senator Taverna mentioned in her speech, we know that non-invasive neonatal screening can diagnose approximately 40 rare diseases and genetic metabolic disorders. Early screening enables the prevention of these often curable diseases. As parliamentarians, we must ensure that the policies we recommend, and especially those in the health domain, are bolstered by scientific evidence. Healthcare policy in the OSCE participating states should reflect evidence-based decision-making. We know that approaches based on science and research lead to better outcomes. While acknowledging that the goal of expanding neonatal screening is laudable in Canada and in likely other participating states, this goal can be achieved through coordination with our sub-national governments. I therefore agree with this supplementary item emphasizing on the need of coordination. By including this item on our agenda, we are recognizing that human security goes beyond what are typically defined as hard security issues. I urge OSCE participating states to put the necessary measures in place to ensure new, newborn health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for giving me an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Colleagues, I, have, I now close the speakers list we have two more speakers. The next speaker is Miss Higgins from Ireland and is getting ready, Gaspardin Orishenko from Russian Federation. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will speak very briefly. I think it, it, this is an important uh, resolution. We are in the Irish Senate next week uh, debating actually a very similar resolution around the access to neonatal screening. And I think the right to health is an important principle. Uh, I know it was mentioned by the proposer that this is important in terms of those genetic conditions where a cure are may be possible, but I think it's also important, even in genetic conditions where a cure may not be possible, uh, to ensure that social supports are put in place. Because I know that many of those who do suffer from uh, rare conditions or rare genetic conditions uh, have found um, that society very often does not plan and does not support those. And I've talked to many families uh, affected by some of the conditions that would be included in the list of 40. I think it's a very good opportunity for society to ensure uh, the best right to health possible and also the best health supports for every citizen. However, I wish to just note one note of, of uh, perhaps caution as we seek in each country, because I'm sure as we are in Ireland next week, in other countries, people will be looking to put in place measures to this effect. And the one note I would have is, I think it is important uh, how such screening is done. So there is an important issue, for example, to ensure uh, that we protect, uh, we look to data protection and we protect the rights of the individuals who are being screened. And so, for example, we are clear uh, that 
there should be no kind of non-medical commercial usage of uh, the genetic databases and so forth that may be put together over the course of genetic screening. I know there's no danger of this in the resolution, but I simply wish to add it as a note because I noted in paragraph uh, 13, while it speaks about strengthening data gathering and sharing mechanisms, I perhaps wanted to just uh, note uh, that, of course, data protection and appropriate consent mechanisms are part of that as well. Again, uh, this is really around the process of how, uh, but fundamentally I support the resolution and I will vote for it. Thank you. And I now pass the floor to Kaspardin Orishenko from Russian Federation. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Что еще? Прежде всего, мне хотелось поблагодарить госпожу Паолу Таверну, которая очень вовремя и очень научно обоснованно составила данную резолюцию. Актуальность этого вопроса подчеркивается тем, что, ну, например, у нас в России реализованы две национальных программы по строительству неонациальных центров, что позволяет на огромном евразийском континенте, который называется Россия, сегодня оказывать высококвалифицированную помощь в медицинских учреждениях. На что бы я хотел обратить внимание, я, и госпожа автор об этом уже немножко говорила, но я хотел бы сакцентировать внимание на том, что сегодня в нашем регионе Наблюдается очень тревожная тенденция, когда женщины становятся матерями впервые в возрасте 30-34 лет. Но репрезентативные научные наблюдения говорят, что в таком возрасте возрастает серьезно риск врожденных заболеваний новорожденных детей. Поэтому, конечно же, и это мы, ни в кое, я не хочу в этом обвинить наших женщин, это говорит о том, что мы не создали для них условий социализации с тем, чтобы они в более раннем возрасте начинали выполнять свою детородную функцию. И вот этот фактор очень серьезно делает более актуальной данную резолюцию. Что бы я хотел, на что я бы хотел обратить внимание и, может быть, нам с вами подумать, как это сделать. Мы с вами уже имеем прецеденты, когда редактирование генома человека преследуется по закону. И это правильно делается, потому что мы не можем просчитать тех последствий для последующих поколений, когда мы вторгаемся в святая святых, человеческой природы, это геном. Мы знаем такой прецедент в Китайской Народной Республике, в нашей стране делаются попытки редактирования генома. Поэтому, если мы предложим в этой резолюции еще и на уровне национальных законодательств отрегулировать эту тему, было бы очень уместно и очень актуально. А так, резолюция очень своевременная, очень грамотная и заслуживает всяческого одобрения. Спасибо. Спасибо. We are at the end of speakers list and can therefore move to the consideration of the three amendments submitted. Copies of the amendments have been made available. The correct version is entitled AS19SI7 amend. In discussing those amendments, I will call the proposer of the amendment first, and after I will call any opponent of the amendment. After I will ask the sponsor of this item, Signora Taverna, for her opinion, and then I shall put the amendment to the vote. Amendment one. I call Mr. Kornienko from Russian Federation to propose Amendment 1. Уважаемые коллеги, мы предлагаем в пункте первом проекта, где речь идет о праве на здоровье как об основном из основных прав человека, придерживаться формулировки, заложенной в уставе ВОЗ. Обладание наивысшим достижимым уровнем здоровья является одним из основных прав всякого человека. 
Уже неоднократно на Ассамблее говорилось о том, что нам следует в своих документах стремиться к тому, чтобы максимально были использованы формулировки, уже согласованные на международном уровне. Данное предложение идет как раз в русле таких усилий. Прошу поддержать. Спасибо. Does anyone wish to speak against amendment one? Signora Taverna, ci vuole dare sua opinione, per favore? Apprezzo l'intento con il quale è stato presentato l'emendamento e do parere favorevole. Grazie. I shall now put amendment one to the vote. Will all those in favor of amendment one please raise their voting cards? All those against Amendment 1, please raise voting cards. Any abstentions? Amendment 1 is adopted by 58-4, 3 against, 1 abstention. We now need to vote on paragraph 1 as amended. Anyone against? I therefore take it amendment 1 Paragraph one, as amended, is agreed to. We will now take paragraphs two to nine together. Does anyone want a separate vote on paragraphs two to nine? It's not the case, so we can take paragraphs two to nine together. Is anyone against? I then take it paragraphs two to nine are agreed to. Amendment two, I call Ms. Moore from Canada to propose amendment two. Merci, Madame Taverna, d'avoir ajouté ce point additionnel important sur les soins néonatales comme objectif de développement social. J'appuie entièrement les principes énumérés dans le point additionnel, dont celui de prier les États participants de réduire la mortalité infantile et néonatale et de garantir un accès effectif aux soins de santé pour les enfants et les nouveaux-nés. Je propose d'ajouter un paragraphe au point additionnel après le paragraphe 9 sur la santé obstétricale. Comme Comme l'amendement l'indique, la violence obstétricale renvoie au manque de respect et au mauvais traitement à l'endroit des femmes pendant l'accouchement. Cet acte est reconnu en tant que violation des droits des femmes par l'Organisation mondiale de la santé et peut comprendre la violence physique et verbale, les soins sans consentement, les soins non confidentiels, l'abandon ou le refus de soins, la détention et la discrimination fondée sur les attributs particuliers. La violence obstétricale affecte non seulement la mère, mais peut avoir aussi un impact négatif considérable sur le nouveau-né et sa prise en charge, puisqu'elle peut faire hésiter la mère à demander des services de soins de santé maternelle ou des soins de santé pour son enfant. Elle peut compromettre l'allaitement, compromettre des pratiques qui ont été reconnues scientifiquement scientifiquement comme la pratique du pot à pot en période post-accouchement. Il s'agit d'une question importante qui ne reçoit pas suffisamment d'attention. Je vous serais très reconnaissante d'appuyer mon amendement. Merci. Je vous remercie. Does anyone wish to speak against amendment 2? No. Signora Taverna, quale sua opinione sull'oggetto? 
anche se l'argomento non è strettamente legato agli screening neonatali, ne riconosco la bontà e l'importanza, quindi esprimo parere favorevole. Grazie. I will now put amendment 2 to the vote. I recall, dear colleagues, that right to vote is restricted to members of delegation, not staff. Will all those in favor of amendment 2 please raise their voting cards? Will all those against Amendment 2 please raise voting cards? Are there any abstentions? Amendment 2 is adopted by 68 for and zero against, zero abstentions. We will now take paragraphs 10 to 14 together. Does anyone wish a separate vote on any of those paragraphs? Yes, Ireland, okay. Um, I was hoping I might be able to propose an oral amendment of a single word to paragraph 13. So I don't know how that affects simply the adding of the word protection after data sharing and um, uh, transfer in the, for that EU paragraph. Okay. But so I don't know uh, how that affects. So, so your concern is only on 13? Just on 13. Okay. Between gathering and sharing the okay. word protection. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Netherlands, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, just to clarify also paragraph 13, um, as I'm a, a newcomer here in this committee, uh, I was wondering why we have taken out this, of, of uh, um, put this... Ex excuse me, sir, excuse me, colleague. Uh, I suggest that yeah. we now, um, there is only request on uh, paragraph 13 for separate vote. So I have not, not heard anything else. So I suggest that I take paragraphs 10 to 12 together and then separate 13 and then remains 14. So I ask you, um, taking paragraphs 10 to 12, 10 to 12 together, is anyone against? Nobody? So paragraphs 10 to 12 are adopted. Now we come to paragraph 13 and um, Ireland wishes the floor, you have it. Um, it it's a very small suggestion of an oral amendment that after data gathering, uh, there may be a comma and the word uh, protection also added. So data gathering, protection and sharing so that it is in line with uh, the GDPR, GDPR and other kind of issues of consent and data protection are considered in data gathering and data sharing. Uh, again, this is around ensuring we do not have commercial exploitation of uh, material gathered in the course of genetic testing uh, without consent. Thank you. Thank you. And I give the floor to the Netherlands on the same paragraph, 13. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll keep it brief then. Um, I was just wondering why we have specified the European Union here as member states and not the usual language uh, of participating states. Why we have uh, uh, sp specified in, a, in this resolution the European Union. Thank you for the question. Um, I will uh, submit the, to the oral amendment <coughs> by Ireland and the question to the author, 
What is your opinion, please, Senatore? Per l'emendamento orale eh, della collega irlandese dell'inserimento della parola protezione eh, dei dati sono assolutamente d'accordo, eh, eh, anzi apprezzo eh, l'ulteriore ampliamento e precisazione che abbiamo inserito. Eh, sulla domanda del collega dei Paesi Bassi non c'è una reale, è una, è una dicitura procedurale con la quale si è sviluppata la, eh, la risoluzione, non si voleva assolutamente, è in, in un ambito OSCE nel quale la presento, quindi non è assolutamente legata solamente all'Unione all Europea, ma a tutta l'area, questo lo tengo a precisare. Se, se propone un emendamento orale di sostituzione di European Union con eh, l'area più ampia per me non, non ci sono problemi. Conosce, Conosce non ci sono problemi. L'OSCE comprende anche l'area europea. Grazie. Um, is anyone opposing the oral amendment by Ireland which introduces in letter B of paragraph 13 the word protection? It's not opposed. Is anyone opposing the substitution in paragraph 13 of EU members by OSC parliamentary assembly members? Oh, sorry, OSCE participating states. Canada, please. Are you opposing? I'm chair. Microphone, please. Please, um, if we say um, OSC, which I agree with, OSC participating member states, then the following sentence which says to create a harmonious legislative framework, that does not necessarily occur amongst all the OSC participating states. We do not create harmonious legislation in every state. So in the EU, EU, you can do that, but you cannot do that with each one of us who have sovereign states, who have our own legislative frameworks. So I don't know how that would work if you change it, although I agree with the OSCEPA change, one may have to talk about legislation instead of a harmonious legislative framework, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> Thank you. I take your intervention as objection to this substitution of the term in the first line, and then we have a clear thing. So this question by Netherlands and possible substitution falls by the uh, opposal made by Canada. I then put amend uh, paragraph 13 as amended, to the, as amended by Irish oral proposal to the vote. Who votes for it? Please hold up your voting cards. Anyone, uh, anyone against? Abstentions? Amendment 2 as amended is adopted, uh, sorry, paragraph 13 as amended is adopted by 51 yes, 1 no, 5 abstentions. We now I put uh, paragraph 14. 
to the vote? Any change to OSCEPA from, uh, from EU? That Remember, that was brought up by the Netherlands. We need to deal with that, Madam Chair. No, I took your, uh, I took your words, uh, dear colleague, as objection, because if not, we do not have a coherent uh, text. So, it's off. I will proceed. Paragraph 14. Denmark. Denmark, please. I think we have to vote about uh, paragraph 13. We just did. Amendment. Amended by, we just did. Amended by Ireland, we did. And as I said, and it was adopted, last vote. And on that question of EU and OSCPA, I heard from Canada that it, the, to substitute in the first line of paragraph 13, EU by OSCPA or participating states would not be coherent with the text in letter A. So I took this as an opposition to the question and the potential amendment of these uh, names of addressees. And I strongly urge to go ahead because I think the author, the author of the text has uh, carefully thought about uh, the addressees and therefore I took the Canadian intervention as an opposition. It was not meant to be an opposition, Madam Chair. What I did say was that I agreed with the Netherlands saying OSCEPA because I think it applies to the whole region. And if we just remove the word harmonious and just say in the next sentence, make efforts to create legislative frameworks, it means that every sovereign nation can create their own legislative frameworks within the OSCEPA. That's, that's all I meant, I meant. I did not speak against the amendment to add OSCEPA. But if we agreed to that, then we'd have to take out the word harmonious. Thank you. Allora, uh, do la parola alla senatrice uh, Taverna per uh, chiarire un po', se possibile, per favore. Allora, io penso che sia corretto eh, a questo punto e non so se proceduralmente si può ripetere la votazione, considerare come due emendamenti orari sia quello dei Paesi Bassi sia quello del Canada. Nei Paesi Bassi inseriamo l'area OSCE e successivamente armonizziamo il testo sostituendo il quadro normativo con legislazione in maniera tale che questo vada a limare quella che potrebbe essere un'incongruenza tra la sostituzione di Unione Europea con eh, parlamentari OSCE e la normativa con la legislazione. Quindi facendo queste due modifiche si rende l'articolo, il um, punto 13 armonico e si eh, toglie la, eh, pro, la difficoltà di individuare solo l'Unione Europea come l'area dove una normativa possa essere armonizzata. Io credo che si possa fare così, eh, normativa con legislazione e Unione Europea con aria OSCE. It's ok? Eh, sì, lo posso far preparare anche scritto. Al numero 13. Può andare bene fatta così. Thank you. Uh, the floor goes to Italy, but I can make you a suggestion, so maybe we can shorten the discussion. Um, according to uh, the uh, speech of the author, uh, I take up 
this as an oral proposal. I agree to come back on it uh, despite procedure because I want to have clear text and, if possible, clear consensus. Um, paragraph 13, so I hear first line would read, calls on OSCE member participating. participating states. Letter A, make efforts in order to create legislative framework so as to ensure that the right to comprehensive newborn screening is ensured in a uniform fashion across OSCE part participating states yes. or OSC area. OSC, what is better? Across, thank you, across the OSCE region. region yes, good. The, any uh, any uh, reactions to that oral proposal? No. Netherlands, please. Uh, also, thanks to please. Canada, we fully agree with this text because that will be in harmonious text. And thanks to Italy, and I applaud her for a very good resolution. Thank you. So I put this paragraph 13 now as amended uh, by the question of Netherlands and as orally now spoken out by author and myself to the vote, who is for paragraph 13 as amended on that point? Is anyone against paragraph 13 as now amended? No, abstentions? So paragraph 13 with this amendment is adopted by 58 against zero and zero abstentions. We then uh, look at paragraph 14. Is anyone against paragraph 14? So I take it paragraph 14 is, um, is adopted. Amendment 3. I call Ms. Moore from Canada to propose amendment 3. Merci. Euh, je ne vais pas réitérer mes observations précédentes concernant l'importance de lutter contre la violence obstétricale et d'améliorer l'expérience de l'accouchement pour le bien-être des mères et des nouveaux-nés. L'ajout que je propose après le paragraphe 14 porterait sur le rôle des bureaux des institutions démocratiques et des droits de l'homme. Euh, ce bureau s'avère une ressource précieuse en matière de recherche et d'analyse sur les droits de la personne et pourrait nous aider, nous les parlementaires, ainsi que les États participants à l'OSCE, en étudiant cette question en point pour trouver des pratiques exemplaires. En comprenant mieux le phénomène du manque de respect et des mauvais traitements de lors de l'accouchement et en disposant de recommandations pour un suivi concret, nos gouvernements euh, et nous pourrons prendre des mesures fondées sur des preuves pour améliorer les soins néonatales. Cet amendement propose une première étape importante dans ce processus. Je vous remercie à nouveau, Madame Taverna, d'avoir présenté ce point additionnel important. J'espère obtenir le soutien de tous les délégués à mon amendement. Merci. Does anyone wish to speak against Amendment 3? Yes, United States, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I support uh, the vast majority of this amendment. I have a problem with only two words in the amendment on line 4 that says excessive or. And the reason is because we actually changed the definition of obstetric violence from the, from the previous amendment we adopted to this amendment by suggesting excessive medical intervention. Using the word excessive is obstetric violence. Now, the meaning of the word excessive can include greater than normal, but normal, of course, is defined as the average uh, care. So if we want to improve care, we should be careful to say, to somehow claim that excessive care, because excessive in one country might be adequate for that country and necessary in another country, we want to raise that standard. 
I just think that the ODIR is not charged with making medical decisions, and the use of the word excessive or brings a new dimension to that amendment that I don't think is, uh, is just the use of the right word. So I would suggest an oral amendment either to remove excessive or or to change excessive to unnecessary. And I will leave it to the chair as to which one would might be preferable. That's uh, very generous. If you all do it, <laughs> I would have too much power. No. Um, uh, uh, including, um, I give the word to the author. Which uh, option do you prefer put forward by United States as an oral amendment? No, io se fosse possibile proceduralmente vorrei ascoltare la promotrice dell'emendamento che se eh, è d'accordo con quello che è stato sì. l'indicazione okay. da parte degli Stati Uniti sì. per me l'emendamento è ecco. comunque eh, recepibile, capisco l'obiezione sì. perché può entrare... Va bene, va bene, va bene. I give the floor to Canada, please, author of the amendment. Euh, oui, je suis en accord avec la suggestion de mon collègue. Oui, on peut euh, enlever le mot excessif. On le biffe. On le biffe. Uh, we take oral proposal uh, to delete the two words excessif or in line four of the amendment three. Does anyone oppose this oral proposal? Russian Federation? Коллеги, я еще раз хотел бы обратить внимание на то замечание, которое сделала сделала делегация Соединенных Штатов Америки. Мы действительно переступили грань. Мы уже пытаемся формулировать, как написано в стандартах сугубо медицинских, поэтому я думаю, что нам надо остановиться и, согласившись с поправкой, вернее, с осторожным замечанием делегации Соединенных Штатов Америки, заменить это слово и принять поправку в том виде, в котором, ну, вот, я так понимаю, сформулировали уже две делегации. Но не надо нам сегодня вносить медицинскую терминологию в наши политические документы. Это неправильно. Спасибо. Um, thank you. So I take it it was not an objection to the deletion of the terms excessive or. Thank you. Um, so then I see no objection to this oral proposal to amendment three. I put amendment three as now, I put amendment three as now orally amended to the vote. All those in favor, please raise your cards. All those against, please show cards. Any abstentions? Amendment three, as orally amended, is adopted by 58 yes, one against, Two abstentions. That concludes the consideration of amendments to this supplementary item. Thank you. I now can put to the vote the, the resolution as amended. Those in favor of adopting the draft resolution, please raise voting cards.
Those against, please raise voting cards. Abstentions? This draft resolution as amended is adopted by 61 yes, zero against, one abstention. Ringraziamo la senatrice Taverna per suo lavoro e le auguriamo una buona continuazione. Grazie. Chers et chers collègues, we now move to the next supplementary item under the title Combating Xenophobia, Aggressive Nationalism and Related Intolerance. We have no amendments to this item. I give the floor to Kaspadin Turov from Russian Federation, who is the sponsor of this draft resolution. Спасибо, уважаемый государственно председательствующий, уважаемые коллеги. Для меня честь выступать сегодня перед вами по такой теме, которая касается без преувеличения всего человечества и та историческая память, которая есть, и та трагедия, которая произошла 75 лет назад, а именно через год наше человечество будет отмечать важнейшую дату победы над фашизмом, победу над нацизмом. И мне кажется, что эта резолюция является очень важным вставляющим работы нашей парламентской ассамблеи. Мы с вами помним, с чего начиналась работа и открытие ассамблеи в Люксембурге со слов премьер-министра Люксембурга Ксавье Бетель, который как раз в своей речи и напомнил о той исторической памяти, о тех событиях, которые происходили в те страшные годы во время Второй мировой войны. Он вспомнил и привел пример Аушвица и других событий, которые являются трагическими для всего человечества. Уважаемые коллеги, мы вчера провели в преддверии рассмотрения резолюции «Круглый стол» и очень благодарим наших коллег из ряда стран, которые приняли в нем участие. Мы рассматривали вопрос, связанный с борьбой с героизацией нацизма и то, как наши страны могут вместе этому противодействовать. Наша настоящая резолюция – это в первую очередь шаг по привлечению внимания международной общественности к наблюдаемому в ряде стран мира росту и проявления нацизма, неонацизма, ксенофобии и связанной с ними нетерпимости. Мне хотелось бы, коллеги, попросить нас уйти всех от политизации этого вопроса и не превращать эту э, тему в какую-то спекуляцию или переводить ее в фарс, потому что она касается действительно каждого человека. Сегодня мы являемся свидетелями того, что несмотря на выработанные и функционирующие в рамках ООН, ОБСЕ, Совета Европы, правовые механизмы, отрицающие, осуждающие и недопускающие проявление героизации нацизма, ксенофобии и связанной с ними нетерпимости, в целом ряде стран открыто ведется пропаганда нацистских идей и ценностей, поднимают голову национал-радикалы, активизируются попытки расколоть общество по национальному и языковому признакам. Особенную озабоченность вызывают набирающиеся обороты кампании по переписыванию истории Второй мировой войны, циничные попытки обеления военных преступников и их пособников, тех, кто создавал и воплощал теорию расового превосходства, объявления сотрудничавших с нацистами коллаборационистов, участниками национал-освободительных движений и кочувственные усилия политических элит ряда стран по разрушению исторической памяти. Такие безответственные несовместимые с международными обязательствами действия, к сожалению, приводят к тому, что в Европе появляется поколение 
которая не знает правду о самой страшной войне в истории человечества, в том числе о предназначении и многочисленных военных преступлениях подразделений организации СС, которая признана Нюрбинским трибуналом преступной. Уважаемые коллеги, мы видим прямую угрозу основополагающим ценностям демократии и правам человека, серьезный вызов международной и региональной безопасности и стабильности в целом. Убеждены, что наиболее актуальной задачей на направление, направление борьбы с героизацией нацизма и иными видами деятельности, способствующему проявлению расизма и расовой дискриминации, сегодня остается объединение усилий стран в деле недопущения восстановления ложных ценностей, превосходства одной нации, религии, культуры над другими народами. Уважаемые коллеги, я благодарен тем, кто уже поддержал нашу резолюцию в ходе ее вынесения на обсуждение, и надеюсь, что сегодня мы ее примем для того, чтобы вместе сохранять ту историческую память и не допустить проявления угрозы, которая была в далеких 74 года назад в Европе и по всему миру. Только вместе мы сможем, объединившись, сохранить и память, и противостоять неонацизму и героизации фашизма на территории Европы и мира. Спасибо. Спасибо. Uh, we have quite a long speakers list for this debate. It contains 10 speakers. Uh, I will close it at the end of the first contribution. I would still give you three minutes to be equal with the other um, uh, supplementary items, but please, if you can shorten it, we will move ahead faster. Um, the first speaker is Ms. Miliute from Lithuania, while Mr. Whittingdale, United Kingdom, is getting ready. Thank you. My grandfather was just 10 years old on May 22, 1948, when the occupation force, together with the Red Army, came to his village in Lithuania, took him with the family, put in a train wagon designed for animals, and exiled them to Krasnoyarsk, a region in Siberia 5,000 kilometers away from their home. In 10 years period, 300,000 Lithuanian people were exiled. In general, totalitarian communist regimes in various countries demanded more than 100 million lives in the last 100 years and has condemned an endless number of people to violence and exploitation. exploitation. Using the false idea of liberation, the communist movements deprived innocent people from their rights and freedoms, such as freedom of belief, assembly, and many other that are inviolable. I am concerned why this draft resolution talking about totalitarian regimes condemns Nazism but ignores the crimes of communism that were as horrible. I want to stress that Lithuania pursues policy of zero tolerance as relates to racism, discrimination, intolerance, and xenophobia, but should be, it should be addressed in an impartial, balanced, and comprehensive way with a clear focus on human rights. In this regard, resolution on combating xenophobia, aggressive nationalism, and related intolerance tabled by the Russian delegation departs from the main lines of fighting intolerance, discrimination, and xenophobia. The resolution apparently pursues different goals than those declared. It is rather promoting the political agenda of its author based on monopolization of the Second World War history and att attempting to discredit and even question the statehood of countries who suffered the Soviet occupation after the Second World War. If the history issues and the totalitarian regimes are addressed in the text, it should reflect a comprehensive approach to all racist and totalitarian ideologies in history, especially Stalinist regime, which all deserve to be thoroughly studied if our aim is to ensure a proper and comprehensive understanding of the complexities of racism. I want to draw your attention that we believe that these type of resolutions tabled in different formats by Russia should be treated as a continuous attempt by Russia to discredit statehood of neighboring countries and to bluntly disregard historical events. For all the reasons specified before, we would like to kindly ask OECPA members not to support this resolution and even take it out from the agenda of today's committee. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. The speakers list is now closed.
And we move to the next speaker, Mr. Whittingdale from United Kingdom, while Mr. Khubarov from Ukraine is preparing himself. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. There is much in this resolution with which I could not disagree. My own country, the United Kingdom, has a very proud record in fighting Nazism and fascism. For a, year, for a whole year during the Second World War, it was Britain that stood alone in fighting Nazi uh, aggression. We were then, of course, joined by our allies from America and from Russia. But Nazism and fascism is not the only threat uh, to freedom and arguably not even the main one. During the 20th century, it is estimated that 28 million people have died under fascist regimes. But at the same time, 94 million have died under communism in China, in Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, and elsewhere. And Stalin, who led the Red Army against the Nazis, then went on to kill perhaps 15 to 20 million of his own people. And for many countries who were occupied by the Nazis, their occupation was simply replaced by occupation under the Soviet Union. In some cases, the secret police headquarters, the building occupied by the German Gestapo, was simply taken over by the KGB or their local equivalent. And I have to say that I understand why those countries do not wish to continue to have monuments which glorify the occupation under the Soviet times. And I can therefore fully sympathize with their wish to remove those and see that for them, decommunization is as important as denazification. And therefore, for the same reasons that my colleague from Lithuania has expressed, I cannot support this resolution. Thank you. I now pass the floor to Mr. Khubarov from Ukraine and Mr. Otherhold from United States is getting ready. Госпожа председатель, уважаемые коллеги, утверждается, что британскому писателю и публицисту, автору термина «холодная война» Артуру Блэру, которого мы все лучше знаем под псевдонимом Джордж Оруэлл, принадлежат такие слова. Политический язык нужен для того, чтобы ложь звучала правдиво, чтобы убийство выглядело респектабельным и чтобы воздух можно было ухватить руками. Мне представляется, уважаемые коллеги, эти слова прекрасно иллюстрируют ситуацию, сложившуюся с предоставлением нам проекта резолюции о борьбе с ксенофобией, агрессивным национализмом и связанной с ними нетерпимостью. Я считаю издевательством над здравым смыслом само внесение подобной резолюции от члена парламента России, государства, согласно документам нашей организации, нарушившего все в своих отношениях с Украиной все 10 хельсинских принципов. Уважаемые коллеги, согласитесь, мы должны сохранять собственное достоинство, достоинство своих народов и быть последовательными борцами с проявлениями расизма, экстремизма, неонацизма и связанной с ними нетерпимостью, особенно на уровне государств. В этой связи мы не можем закрывать глаза на унизительность положения, когда представитель парламента государства, признанного Генеральной Ассамблеей ООН, Парламентской Ассамблеей Совета Европы, а также многими документами нашей организации, агрессором и оккупантом, пытается манипулировать очень важными для нас категориями. Настаиваю на том, что целью представленного проекта является не борьба с ксенофобией и любыми иными э, формами нетерпимости, но явное стремление увести нас от очевидного факта, что, собственно, Российская Федерация выступает в роли государства, чья агрессивная политика по отношению к другим суверенным государствам, в том числе через поддержку, радикальных, неонацистских организаций в разных европейских странах и является источником роста нетерпимости и насилия в современном мире. Здесь говорили о личных таких ощущениях. 
Мою маму депортировал Сталин вместе со всем крымско-татарским народом, и моей маме было 11 лет. Это случилось в 1944 году. В 2014 году меня депортировали из Крыма российские оккупанты. Меня депортировал Путин. Моей маме 86 лет. Она живет в Крыму. Я не могу ее видеть, потому что мне запретили въезжать домой российский оккупант. Uh, please, Я please. предлагаю не поддерживать данную резолюцию, отклонить ее. Это цинизм и неуважение по отношению к нам. Спасибо. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while the U.S. Uh, supports efforts to address hate in our own country and throughout the OSCE region, uh, we have great reservations and uh, therefore cannot support this supplementary item. Here, the Russian Federation does not acknowledge its own aggressive nationalism in Ukraine and Georgia, and it certainly does not show respect for ethnic and ling linguistic minorities in occupied Crimea as this resolution advocates. I think it's important that we, mu that we remember also the victims of Soviet occupation that has been pointed out, both during and after the Second World War. Uh, I think any of us here would welcome any resolution that takes into account an open and honest dialogue and how we can better combat prejudice and discrimination regardless of where it is. However, we feel that this resolution fall short in that regard, and I yield back. Thank you for being short also. Uh, the next speaker is Mr. Vizotsky from Ukraine, while Mr. Bakas from Lithuania is getting ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, frankly speaking, it's a, it's a very cynical hypocrisy to see the, such, uh, such kind of resolution uh, sponsored by the Russian Federation. Uh, the honorable colleague from the Russian Federation said that uh, uh, we forgot the truth about the World War II. Uh, well, the truth is uh, about that the most horrible uh, war in the history of mankind was made possible be because of the pact between Stalin and Hitler, the communism <coughs> and Nazism. And now what we see after the World War II, we see that the Russian Federation is in fact uh, being an ancestor of the Nazi practi uh, practi uh, uh, practices of annexation of uh, foreign lands. You know, uh, the first country that after the World War II in Europe annexed the territory of another European country is in fact Russia that annexed Ukrainian Crimea and started a war at Donbas. Uh, it's an aggressive war uh, that was banned by all of the international law and the, uh, we see that uh, as Hitler in 1938, the Russian Federation uh, is, uh, uh, doesn't pay any attention to the obligations and rules of uh, coexistence in the modern world. When you uh, uh, say about uh, uh, the states uh, that promote neo-Nazism, uh, uh, you know, for the last three years or so, I uh, saw only one country that officially promoted neo-Nazi Congress. Uh, it was Russia when in 2015, we uh, saw a neo-Nazi conference that uh, uh, gathered all of the neo-Nazis and radical far-right parties in St. Petersburg alongside with the uh, Russian neo-Nazi uh, movements. And it was baked by uh, then Vice Prime Minister, Mr. Rogozin. The only country that baked neo-Nazism on the official level supported it with the, their MPs, you know, uh, with uh, uh, members of the government was Russia. Uh, Russia is helping a far-right movement in Europe and financing it. We all know, know this, you know, uh, many facts were given in the past years. Uh, uh, Neo-Nazi groups baked by Russia are fighting at Donbass. And uh, one of the paragraphs of uh, this resolution uh, we see uh, 
uh, paragraph 7, it said that recognizing the extremist uh, also manifests uh, itself in form of increasing number of acts uh, of violence in the OEC area. I can recall that we see numerous uh, extremist acts of violence, uh, violence in Russia, you know, uh, the LGBT community in Chechnya. We know that uh, the pastors uh, Baptist, uh, of Baptist churches, the Protestant pastors are being accused of extremism in Russia and in jail, and Russia is prosecuting uh, the churches that are not official Orthodox church. So please pay attention to yourself, pay attention to your international obligations, and don't try to manipulate this, uh, uh, our assembly. No, Thank you. Please. please vote against this resolution. Thank you. Next is Mr. Bakas from Lithuania, and then Mr. Kornienko from Russian Federation. Thank you, Mrs. Chairwoman. Ladies and gentlemen, it is necessary to condemn crimes related to all totalitarian regimes. Xenophobia, aggressive nationalism, and intolerance are associated not only with the fascist Nazi regimes, but also with the crimes of the communist regime. There is not only a brown flag, but also, also a red flag. The communist regime killed, sentenced, sentenced to death millions and millions of people. In the last century in Eastern U Europe, Russia, one dictatorship was replaced by unfair dictatorship. Hundreds of thousands of people were deported to the most rem remote parts of the former Soviet Union without trial. The communist regime sought to destroy the generation, nation, and culture. Mr. Putin says the collapse of the Soviet Union was the, the biggest geopolitical catastrophe. In some countries, there are still monuments to the leaders of these regimes. Public nostalgia for communism is encouraged. The success of the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, Russia mocks the memory of the dead, exiled people. Prevents visiting the graves of ex exiled, of deceased parents and grandparents from their, their children living in Lithuania and other countries. It is necessary to condemn crimes related to all totalitarian regimes and attempts to rehabilitate them. Thank you. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Kornienko, Russian Federation, and Mr. Kasyunas, Lithuania is getting ready. Большому сожалению, все предыдущие выступающие, видимо, вообще не читали предложенную резолюцию. Это к большому сожалению. То есть это говорит о том, что им совершенно наплевать о том, что происходит сейчас в Европе возрождение неонацизма, а по сути дела фашизма. И возрождают именно такие политики, которые приходят на националистических своих взглядах в парламенты, которые гордятся своими родителями, боровшихся вместе с фашистами за установление коричневой чумы в Европе. Какая разница, кто выдвинул резолюцию? Если там все правильно написано в духе нашего времени, голосование не за какие-то преференции для России, а именно против одобрения нацизма в прошлом и современности. Почему же Украина... Великобритания и Литва против. Среди прибалтийских политиков есть мнение, что осуждение героизации нацизма и неонацизма, исламофобии и антисемитизма, эта инициатива является однобокой и полностью соответствует стандартам прав человека. Надо же, как интересно все оказывается. Оказывается, европейским стандартам прав человека подразумевает незыблемое право на нацизм что мы сегодня и наблюдаем здесь в зале. Многие ли сейчас помнят про резолюцию 3379 Генеральной Ассамблеи ООН под названием 
ликвидация всех форм расовой дискриминации, которая была принята в 1975 году. Цитирую. «Всякая теория расового различия или превосходства в научном отношении ложна, в моральном отношении предосудительно, в социальном отношении несправедливо и опасно. Выражаем тревогу в связи с проявлением расовой дискриминации, все еще имеющейся вместе в некоторых районах мира, которая в ряде случаев укрепляется правительствами отдельных стран путем законодательных, административных и других мер. Эта резолюция была, к сожалению, отменена 16 декабря 1991 года, немедленно после распада СССР по инициативе США. Россия в вопросе отношений дискриминации, как и во многих других, выступает на стороне справедливости против правил политических игрищ по правилам некоторых стран. Вот здесь вот выступало несколько политиков, представляющих Литву. 25 января текущего года были опубликованы результаты масштабного исследования об отношении к истории Холокоста в странах ЕС, проведенного при поддержке Ельского университета и Европейского союза прогрессивного иудаизма. Ключевой вывод доклада – политика правительства ряда европейских стран направлена на реабилитацию военных преступников Второй мировой войны и сведение к минимуму их роли в геноциде еврейской нации – Согласно исследованию, такие идеи наиболее распространены в Литве, где в парламенте приветствуются именно пособники фашистов, принимаются на самом высоком политическом уровне и получают правительственные и государственные награды. Уважаемые коллеги, мы будем рассматривать голосование против как проявление ксенофобии и русофобии. Благодарю за внимание. Спасибо. Mr. Kashunas from Lithuania is next, and then Mr. Rishak from R R Russian Federation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, dear colleagues, only at the first glance, this supplementary item uh, looks like politi politically correct. If you go deeper, you see a lot of hidden things and topics. Russia promoting its political agenda and tries to monopolize the history of Second World War and attempts to discredit all nations who suffered Soviet occupation during and after Second World War. While we speak about crimes of the Nazi regime, we must not exclude the crimes of communist regime. I want to remind you one very important historical fact. Secret deal between Stalin and Hitler, which was done in 1939, August 23. It is better known as pact between Ribbentrop and Molotov. This deal opened possibilities for Nazis to start the Second World War. And when brave British, French people fought against Nazi regime, at the same time, Kremlin and Nazi regime divided Central Europe and formed spheres of influence. I want to remind you what for Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and other nations of our region, 1945 May was the start of a new occupation with repressions, tortures, and deportations. More than 300,000 people from Lithuania were deported to Siberia. And now, representatives from Russia Federation, in this supplementary item, calls us to resist attempts to demolish the monuments for Red Army, who was a driving force for the occupation of our countries. This is the reason, not only reason, of course, but one of a lot of reasons why we cannot agree and asking all of you to vote against this supplementary item. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now have two more speakers on the list. First, Mr. Richak from Russian Federation, while Mr. Harris from the United States is getting ready. Уважаемые коллеги, вы знаете, мне кажется, что я присутствую в каком-то трибунале, но осуждают не нацистские проявления, не фашистующие течения, а осуждает уже Россию и Советский Союз. 
Вы знаете, как какое-то странное явление и странное чувство – это страну осуждают, которая сумела нанести поражение фашистскому режиму вместе с другими государствами, сломать хребет фашизму, потерял при этом 50 миллионов человек, из которых только 10 миллионов – это были военные потери – а 17 миллионов – это были жертвы как раз нацистующих молодчиков подразделений СС и тех, кто их поддерживал, в том числе в таких странах, которые говорили Литва, Латвия, Эстония. Да, действительно, мы признаем, это исторический факт. Мы вынуждены были депортировать часть населения. Некоторую часть, не те суммы, не те количества, которые говорят – Потому что кое-кто из коллаборационистов поддерживал фашистские режимы, уничтожали свои, свой народ. Это факт. Но дети вот этих неразоружившихся идей, идей на людей и сейчас хотят возвратить нас в те жуткие времена. Я вам приведу такой пример. Вот пока мы здесь заседаем, 14 наших моряков-подводников ушли из жизни сознательно, сумев каким-то образом, мы даже сами еще разбираемся, чтобы ядерная установка не поглотила всех нас в Баренцевом море. Они задраили люки и предпочли смерть тем, чтобы мы жили и жили наши грядущие поколения. Вот каких мы людей воспитываем, каких людей воспитывает сейчас нацизм. Это не знание истории, это варварство, к которому нас сейчас пригла при приглашают. Еще Екатерина Великая говорила, что невежество – это прямой путь к деформации общества. Я призываю всех нас изучать историю, воздавать должное тем, кто положил жизнь за то, чтобы жизнь процветала на земле, и всегда, всегда помнить, помнить о своем предназначении человека на земле. Благодарю вас за внимание. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Harris from United States, and then I will give a, a response to the debate to the author, Mr. Durov. Mr. Harris, please. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. While I oppose this resolution, I do thank the sponsors of the draft resolution for their willingness to speak out against Nazism. But I wish it went much, much further. We all acknowledge the horrors that Nazism has uh, perpetrated in history, and fully condemn all neo-Nazi movements. But this resolution largely neglects to mention Jews as a target of Nazi movements, and specific and explicit condemnation of anti-Semitism is unfortunately conspicuously absent from this document. Now, Madam Chair, given paragraph 16 of the resolution, it's also very regrettable that Russian Federation civil society organizations such as Memorial which promotes re uh, revelation about the truth of historical past of totalitarian states are persecuted, and that academic freedom to examine the past is too often restricted by state narratives that selectively disregard totalitarian genocidal practices and history. We agree with our Lithuanian colleagues, and the U.S. delegation welcomes open and honest discussions of how we can fully address continuing issues of prejudice authoritarianism and discrimination throughout the region. It's very unfortunate that this resolution does not do this comprehensively. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I have a point of order from Ukraine delegation, but the vote, the speaker's list is closed. What is your point of order, please, Ukraine? Уважаемый, уважаемый госпожа председатель, представитель, представитель Российской Федерации в своем выступлении сказал ужасную вещь. Послушайте перевод, пожалуйста. Он сказал следующее, я цитирую. Мы были вынуждены депортировать часть народов. Представитель э, российской делегации сказал о том, 
что Российская Федерация оправдывает преступления против человечности. Вы, госпожа председатель, вы должны были сделать замечание. The, the things are complex. I remind you that we have another item on the five where you can ask questions to the rapporteur and me about our mission to Ukraine. There will be, uh, if we can move ahead now, you will have time to speak up and ask questions to rapporteur and me who have been in Ukraine. Thank you. So now I give the floor to the author of the supplementary item, Gaspadin Turov. Спасибо, уважаемые коллеги. Ну, как к сожалению, я вначале сказал, что ряд стран могут превратить данную резолюцию в определенный фарс с передергиванием фактов и с переведения темы резолюции. А я прошу еще раз обратить внимание на тему и на текст резолюции, подменить ее со всеми другими фактами. И, к сожалению, те страны, которые это делают, как мне, конечно, не горько это не звучит, хотелось бы, ну и придется об этом сказать, как раз где поднимаются и героизируются те пособники фашизма, нацизма, которые в те годы проводили расовые чистки и участвовали в геноциде собственного народа. Мы знаем, что на Украине регулярно сейчас проходят факельные шествия и героизируются ветераны подразделений СС Галичина. Буквально недавно, в апреле месяце, в Литве, в парламенте были награждены государственными наградами ветераны так называемых лесных братьев, которые воевали в том числе в подразделениях немецкой армии, нацистской армии, а сейчас они возводятся в ранг героев. Мне очень горько об этом говорить. Вот я говорил о выступлении премьера Люксембурга, он говорил про Аушвиц. А я вам хочу сказать про личную такую историю. В 130 километрах от Люксембурга находится город Ахен. И вот там семилетним ребенком мой отец в семейном концлагере, как ребенок, партизана подпольщика находился во время войны. И то, что там с ним происходило, мне не хотелось бы, чтобы никто об этом не просто знал, потому что те страшные вещи, о которых он рассказывал, и то, что у него осталось на теле и на лице на всю жизнь до его смерти, вызывало не просто изумление, как могли люди так поступать в своей жизни. Поэтому, уважаемые коллеги, я понимаю, о всех политических Please, выступлениях прошу резолюцию поддержать, to... потому что направлена на общее сохранение общей памяти. Спасибо. Спасибо. We are at the close of speakers and author to this draft resolution. Uh, we then now move to vote on this draft resolution. Would those in favor? Please raise their voting cards. Is it clear or do I have to please raise them? I'm sorry, I have to repeat. Some are really holding the cards in front of uh, their breasts. Please, uh, I, I recall this vote. Would those in favor of this draft resolution please raise cards high up? Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. But uh, we want like a separate uh, vote on paragraph 12. And uh, I also, um, I would also like to propose an oral amendment to paragraph 14, namely to include the words as well as the LGBTA communities after the word minor minorities. Thank you. But, um, 
I'm quite sorry, uh, you're a bit late on that. We, ha we have, are in the middle of the voting procedure and we are short, getting short on time. I see that uh, the colleagues want to move on. I'm sorry, I just repeat the vote now. All those in favor of this draft resolution after lengthy debate, please raise your voting cards. All those against, please raise cards. <laughs> Abstentions, please. The draft resolution is defeated by 25 against, 11 for, and 13 abstentions. Please abstain from applause on the results of votes. Any votes. Um, I thank the author, Mr. Turov, for his work on this uh, supplementary item. We can move to our final supplementary item, a call for a stronger OSCE action against increased discrimination of Christians in certain OSCE participating states, as well as adherents of other minority faiths. There is one amendment to this item. I give the floor to Mr. Soder, from Sweden, the sponsor of this draft resolution. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wish to express my deep gratitude to many members of this assembly who have supported me in presenting this supplementary item before you, dealing as it does with the rampant increase of discrimination against Christians observed in certain of our participating states, as well as against some other minority faiths. It is a discrimination that sometimes amounts to outright oppression but which is rarely mentioned in our media. It therefore gives rise to a little public debate and reaction. And yet, it is felt acutely by thousands of exposed minority Christians, not least in remote areas. We are talking about marauding attacks on people and property, about biased legislation and about arbitrary obstacles to church registration and practice. I refer you to the text for more examples of what in fact amounts to brazen breaches against one of our organization's most solemn human rights commitments, namely to that of religious freedom. Finally, I wish to underline that the text, while in this case focusing on Christians, is meant to also draw our attention to any discrimination suffered by other religious minorities. Religious freedom must be a right shared by all and in full. This committee, and in due course our entire OC assembly, can make a tangible contribution to the realization of such a goal by taking on board this supplementary item. I therefore humbly plead with you to decide in his favor. May I also, Madam Chair, suggest a minor oral amendment to my own supplementary item. In the second paragraph, I suggest a change of the words freedom of faith and belief to freedom of religion or belief. This is to comply better to the language we use. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. The speakers list for this debate will close at the end of the first contribution. I now open the floor for debate. We have six speakers and we begin with Mr. Azzopardi from Malta and is getting ready Mr. Aktag from Turkey. Speaking times is now two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
um, Article 18 of the Helsinki Final, fin Final Act states everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Freedom of expression and the freedom of religion are basic elements of democracy. These principles cannot be, fu be fulfilled without mutual respect between peoples. Human beings have the right to religious freedom, a right that they possess through the very fact that they are human. Human dignity demands freedom in matters of conscience. It is preoccupying that in the OSC area, we are even experiencing situations where national and local authorities retain that members of minority religions are expected to confine their beliefs to their private life and are banned from public professing or revealing their religion. We, as parliamentarians within the OSCE, should unite and embark on a bridge-building project between cultures and religions. It is only through mutual respect and understanding that we can build a better world. These comments lead me to vote in favor of this draft resolution. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I now declare the speakers list to be closed. Next speaker is Mr. Aktak from Turkey, while Mr. Konyorian, Armenia, is getting ready. Dear Chairperson, while we are discussing the Mr. Soder's supplementary item on discrimination against Christians, at the same time we need to underline with a present need to take immediate action against the challenges pre presented by racism, xenophobia, anti-Muslim sentiment, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism. Hate crimes against any faith are inseparable. We should display a common stance against this common threat. It should be announced that no tolerance will ever be shown to any form of racism. We should remember that we can only cope with these common threats if we show a common awareness and determination. We should emphasize that regardless of their motivation, wherever and by whoever they are committed, and no matter whom they target, no acts of terror can be excused or justified. As to remember the terror attacks against our faith and to commemorate the victim of those crimes, I'd like to underline three incidents among the others. Firstly, a white supremacist terrorist with neo Nazi tendency massacred 11 people on 27 October 2018 while Shabbat morning services were being held. It was the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in the United States. Second, on 15 March 2019, Christchurch, Church, New Zealand, when 51 Muslims praying there were martyred and many others wounded by a fascist and barbarian terrorist. Third, on 21 April 2018, Easter Sunday, three churches in Sri Lanka and three luxury hotels in Columbus City were targeted in a series of coordinated terrorist suicide bombings. Many of the victims were Christian worshippers attending Easter. It is very evident from those incidents that no tolerance should ever be shown to any form of racism. We have a single, consistent, and clear principle of justice without double standards. We regard anti-Islam, anti-Semitism, and anti-Christianity as crimes against humanity. We resolutely denounce and condem condemn all kinds of discrimination and terrorism. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to Mr. Konyorian from Armenia, while Mr. Wachowski from Holy See is getting ready. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, we appreciate attention to the topic of countering intolerance against Christians and members of other religions. Armenia attaches importance to addressing the issue of xenophobia and discrimination targeting religious groups. In 2017, Armenia hosted the high-level conference of OEC chairmanship and the ODIR, preventing and countering hate crimes against Christians and members of other religious groups. Uh, perspectives from OEC and beyond, which brought together representatives of governments, parliaments, academia, and civil society from the OEC participating states. 
we believe that protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms and the further development of effective me measures to counter hate crime and central, uh, are central to preventing discrimination against Christians and members of other religions and beliefs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now the floor goes to Mr. Wachowski from Holy See. Uh, Holy See, who is invited as a representative to this uh, assembly. Next speaker, Mr. Aydin from Turkey. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I would like to thank the authors of the resolution for raising the issue of discrimination of Christians. Unfortunately, discrimination, intolerance, persecution because of religion is an issue of actuality. Even as we speak, thousands uh, across the world are being persecuted, deprived of their fundamental human rights, discriminated against, and killed simply because they are believers. And this is particularly true for Christians. We all have seen barbaric images of Christians beheaded, churches filled with people blown up during liturgical celebrations, ancient Christian communities driven out of their homes, Christian students executed just because they were Christians. And this, is, this tragic phenomenon is not limited to the remote areas of our globe. It is well documented, for example, by the ODR annual report on hate crimes, that Christians are discriminated and sometimes also persecuted even in the OEC area. So once again, I'll thank you for taking up this issue which is key to raise awareness and find solutions together. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. I now give the floor to Ms. Higgins from Ireland, last speaker on the list. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, while I think it is very clear, and, and uh, I thank the proposer of the resolution uh, in their introductory speech, they made it very clear that the intention of this resolution is to touch on all faiths uh, and indeed all beliefs. We know that um, not only uh, oppression against Christians, but anti-Semitism, Islamophobia um, has been an increasing concern, very often layered in an intersectional way with uh, prejudice on rape based on race, prejudice based on gender. And again, we have seen deep stereotyping used uh, against all faiths. Um, I would simply note as well also that the the freedom of faith and belief also encompasses those whose beliefs may not be religious, uh, who also have rights within society and the right to fully participate in society. In this context, um, while I, I think the resolution is very positive and I uh, overall support the resolution, I would just simply want to note a comment in relation to uh, paragraph uh, seven, um, in that, uh, and six and seven, in that the Christian faith uh, it's described here as adherence of other minority faiths. Of course, there are many countries in which the Christian faith is a majority and has had a very strong uh, influence on society. So, for example, when we speak of political pressure in number seven, I just wish to indicate for the record that my interpretation of that is that should not uh, encompass the normal policies to serve a diverse society. So, for example, ensuring that we have health systems that include reproductive rights or ensuring that our education system may uh, contain uh, sex education and other positive forms of education. I say this simply because these are issues we have addressed in Ireland as we move while respecting the faith of every citizen, while ensuring every individual's rights to be free from all forms of discrimination, we also look to the process of uh, building secular public services in our state. So that's simply a note uh, in regard to the interpretation of the phrase political pressure. Thank you. Thank you. While the author is renouncing to have a reacting statement, I heard that you, Mr. Soder, author, suggested uh, in your presentation a draft change to the resolution, which I like to read out as follows, as an oral, I take it as an oral amendment to paragraph two, second line, um, replace the words faith, and belief replaced by the words religion or belief. 
this uh, replacement is intended simply to be consistent with the terminology in our founding document, the Helsinki Final Act. I think we can consider this a simple drafting matter. Any objections? Netherlands first. Yes, I just, my colleague on the right side, he said Netherlands first, so he liked that one. So thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, maybe I just want to make an oral amendment immediately as well. I mean, I do see the point of, of the, the proposal and of the, uh, uh, naming Christians specifically, but I really would urge the, uh, the, the proposal to uh, include Jews and Muslims as well in the heading and in the rest of the text, because it's, uh, if we look at the OCE, uh, I think these three faiths, specifically anti-Semitism these days in Europe, is a much bigger problem in the OCE, and Islamophobia as well, than the issue of Christians in the OCE, which is also an important issue, of course. Thank you. Uh, I pass the word to Belgium. Um, my colleague of Netherlands said exactly what I also wanted to say. I wanted also to propose an oral amendment on the title and also on the paragraph uh, six to there to include uh, the uh, three words. Uh, that is, so after Christians, to include the word Jews and Muslims in certain OSCE participating states because those uh, two uh, religions are uh, not uh, always minority faiths. Thank you. I, I take it uh, Netherlands, oh yes, Russian Federation, we hear you, please. Спасибо, госпожа председатель. Моя делегация, делегация Российской Федерации готова поддержать эту поправку и признает дискуссию на эту тему чрезвычайно своевременно и сожалеет о том, что нам не удалось запустить механизм дискуссии по этому вопросу. И мы поддержим данную резолюцию при условии, если по тексту будут убраны такие слова, как словосочетание, как представительных религиозных меньшинств и различных христианских деноминаций. Потому что это дает очень расширительную трактовку и не позволяет на уровне национальных законодательств конкретные агрессивные псевдорелигиозные организации закрывать. Спасибо. Не надо переживать. Oral amendment to propose. Конкретная узкая поправка состоит в том, что по всему тексту нужно убрать общие формулировки представителей иных религиозных меньшинств и различных христианских деноминаций, которые позволяют очень широко трактовать данную, данную резолюцию. Спасибо. Thank you. Does anyone oppose to the oral amendments by Netherlands, Belgique, and Russian Federation? The author? The author? Thank you, Madam Chair. I fully respect for that we should fight uh, against all sorts of discrimination and, uh, uh, and so. Uh, but this supplementary item especially focuses on Christians and other minority faiths. And if, if we started to, okay. to point out okay. different religions, uh, there might be um, a risk that we miss some. And I think it's better that how it is already in the uh, supplementary item. So I'm opposed to the suggestions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So you oppose uh, the one by Netherlands and Belgium. And do you also oppose the one by Russian Federation? Yes, you oppose them all, so uh, they are uh, off the table. And we move to the written amendment submitted uh, 
This is in the version AS19SI16 amend, and I therefore call on Mr. Wovk from Ukraine to propose amendment one. Mr. Wovk, are you here? Is anyone taking this amendment one? Please go ahead. Yes, uh, it was uh, a little bit me, um, uh, Sergei Vasovsky. Uh, after the paragraph five, we propose to uh, add the subparagraph and mention oppression and arbitrary actions against certain denominations and the clergy and occupied territories. As you know, in uh, occupied uh, Donbass uh, under the Russian control, we have a huge problem when uh, uh, the Baptist churches and Protestant churches uh, are, uh, uh, the clergy of these churches are being oppressed. In Crimea, we see the oppression of uh, the Muslims and so on. So I think it is uh, uh, important to stress that out in this supplementary item. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone wish to speak against Amendment 1? Russian Federation? Уважаемые коллеги, господин председатель, все, что говорит господин Высоцкий, и вот ту поправку, все, что нужно, это просто ложь полная. Значит, если касается поправки, которые в Крыму он бросит, у нас в Симферополе строится самая большая мечеть в Европе. И никакого вероисповедания значит, там не преследуется. Все это чистая ложь, Российская Федерация категорически отвергает данное заявление. Спасибо. What is Mr. Soder's opinion on this amendment one? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think it's, the amendment complements the uh, supplementary item in a good way, so I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. I then put Amendment 1 to the vote. All those in favor of Amendment 1, please raise your voting cards. All those against, please raise your voting cards. Abstentions. Amendment 1 is adopted by 33 yes, 4 no, 2, 12 abstentions. 33 yes, 4 no, 12 abstentions. We now need to vote on paragraph 5 as amended. Is anyone against? I take amendment five as amended is adopted. We now take paragraphs six to eight together. Does anyone wish a separate vote on any of paragraphs six to eight? No. Is anyone against paragraphs six to eight? That's not the case, so uh, I take paragraphs six to eight as adopted. Chers et chers collègues, that concludes the consideration of amendments. I thank you, and we now... Pardon? We, yeah, ah, patience, patience. Um,
we now formally uh, vote on the draft resolution. Would those in favor of adopting the draft resolution please raise your voting cards? Against, please raise your voting cards. <laughs> Abstentions. This draft res resolution is adopted by 33 yes, 14 no, 11 abstentions. Mr. Soder, I thank you very much for your work. We now move to item five on the agenda remarks on the recent work and report of the bureau of our committee related to the situation in ukraine and i pass the floor to mr hachiani our rapporteur thank you madam chair dear colleagues I would like to present you with one of the most recent activity of this bureau and probably one of the most important mission led, uh, led uh, recently by the Parliamentary Assembly. Together with our committee chair, as envoy from OSEPA, we, we went to East Ukraine several time, times since the end of 2018. First, before Christmas, in the Dnipro and Mariupol area on the shores of the Sea of Azoi. Then this year in Kramatorsk and Stanitsia, Luhanska, to name just a few places where we have been. Our goal was to gather facts about the human rights situation and the consequences of the ongoing war on the people of Eastern Ukraine. It was a great honor for me to take part in this mission. I want to thank our chairwoman for our committee who has paid extraordinary efforts for this mission. I also thank the president, Mr. Ceredelli, for his support for this mission and also the secretary general, Mr. Roberto. Both of them positive with, uh, uh, gave us the incentives to work. I know the excellent cooperation we had together with uh, Ms. Kirne during our three re relevant visits. I also wish to express my warmest thanks to Mark Cariel from the Secretariat, whose professionalism was crucial to successfully completion of this mission. Finally, we also express our gratitude to all those who have uh, helped us in this mission. The rationale of this mission was to investigate the humanitarian situation on the ground. It is close to battlefields. It is where weapons put an end to human logic and rational arguments. It is where the danger is every day and everywhere. It is where life is not a self-evident right of the human being. The human drama in Eastern Ukraine must not be forgotten by any of us. There in Eastern Ukraine, a huge number of people experience human drama and pain. There in Eastern Ukraine, there is a lively war. Every moment, every minute, and every hour. 
we here, the, the representatives of the parliament, have no right to close our eyes to what happens every day, every moment. We were, are the hope for, we here are the hope for these people. They should see us present on the spot and see that we care about them. We need to be the angels addressing their fear and the hope counteracting their despair. Our mission of the third community, committee as envoyee of the OSCEPA is disconnected from the political dimension of the Ukrainian conflict. We respect fully all the resolutions of OSCEPA, which are the base of our activities. We have an obligation to serve impartially and effectively in addressing the human drama. We call on all sides to actively assist us in helping our role. We wish to continue and to expand our mission with the help of other personalities. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the assessment we make of, this, of the situation, which is contained in the report that we have recently published, is dramatic. A person continues to die on, on average every day as a victim of this war unfolding before our eyes in the heart of Europe. You probably know the say, far from the eyes, far from the heart. Well, here we are talking about a war which, which is just a few hours flight from here. Counting the victims is not enough to reflect the reality of the ordinary lives of people living close to the daily shelling and the minefields. We met the, the displaced person, people. We went to hospitals at the bedside of the victims of these weapons that we do not have the political will to silence. We met with the most neglected fingers of the society, the prisoners who had just been transferred from the uncontrolled territories. We spoke with civil society and with the inhabitants of those villages that are the nearest to the front line and are forced to move around, avoiding the omnipresent minefields and unexploded ordnances. Finally, and I will insist on that point, we work right through the Stanitsia Luhanska, cro Luhanska crossing point where the collapsed bridge is located and we sadly assessed that to suspect, to, to subject this kind of treatment to human beings is like tortured Audrey. That's why in this report we publish, we make, we make the following urgent recommendations. A sustained ceasefire as committed repeatedly by the sites, sites in Eastern Ukraine is certainly needed for the sake of the safety of civilians, especially children, as well as of military personnel. This engagement under the Minsk Peace Agreement should be further encouraged, and the steps recently taken in the Stanitsia Luhanska should lead, lead to a rapid improvement of the crossing conditions at this entry-exit checkpoint, starting by the repair of the collapsed bridge section. Such measures will enhance prospects for a political solutions to the conflict and humanitarian gestures of goodwill, such as prisoners' exchange, are to be encouraged. There is urgent need to delink the IDP status to the obtention of social benefits. Both are artificially linked, and this creates a discrimination of eternal displaced persons and also discriminates populations still living in non-government control areas who must seek eternal displaced person status even if they have not moved since the beginning of the war. The search for missing persons must remain high on the priority list of the ongoing negotiations. You should trust me experience on this my experience on this, it will be a key element to the necessary future reconciliation process. While a comprehensive solution is long overdue after the commitments 
made in the Minsk agreement signed by the sides, full compliance by all with international humanitarian law is of crucial importance. Humanitarian measures must be pursued to improve the lives of the millions of people affected by this war, and if you allow me to continue working on those issues during the next year, together with the other colleagues of the committee, of the third committee, it will remain high on the agenda on this committee. I would like to use this opportunity to underline publicly the crucial role played by the OSC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine in easing the tensions in the Donbass. I can assure you all that without the OSC presence, the situation will be much worse today. Our colleagues work in a difficult environment and it is fair to salute their work in this committee. We would like to thank ex-SMM Chief Monitor, Mr. Abakar, congratulate for this work, and we wish to express our wishes to the, to the new Chief Monitor, Mr. Cherik, uh, and hope him soon one monitoring for implementation of a new peace plan. Finally, I close with the following. We must not forget this drama, the struggle for survival of these people should be equally our own concise struggle time. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our rapporteur, Mr. Hadi Chani, for this very succinct and very dramatic report. I now move to uh, point six of the agenda, election of committee officers. I am to communicate that the International Secretariat informs that the following nominations have been received in the table office for chair, Mr. Kiriakos Hadi Chachiani from Cyprus, for vice chair, Mr. Michael Link from Germany, for rapporteur, Ms. Susanna Amador from Portugal, as the position of chair was uncontested, I declare Mr. Kiriakos Hachidiani, Cyprus, elected by acclamation in accordance with Rule 36.5. Congratulations, dear colleague. Likewise, as the position of vice chair is uncontested, I declare the nominee, Mr. Michael Link, Germany, elected by acclamation. <laughs> Mr. Link had to leave us again because his parents have uh, health problems. He, he goes home today. Likewise, as the position of rapporteur is uncontested, I declare Ms. Susanna Amador, Portugal, elected by acclamation. Before I conclude, dear colleagues, I pass the floor to our Secretary General who has a communication. Please stay in the room. Thank you very much, Margareta. I just wanted to congratulate the new officers of uh, the committee for their important uh, task ahead. I would like to congratulate all of you who have worked in this committee. You do a lot of important work here, and I'd like to underline how this uh, assembly pays uh, a lot of importance to the human dimension of the OSC. Uh, we will uh, participate, as we did last year, in big numbers to the human dimension implementation meeting, which is uh, the biggest uh, OSC event uh, with civil society NGOs uh, in uh, September. So 
I urge the new committee officers uh, to participate in big numbers. The Secretariat will, of course, uh, support you, and of course, all other members of the committee who wish to attend the human, uh, implementation, human dimension implementation meeting in Warsaw in September. We will, of course, try to accommodate your participation there. Not only participation, but active participation and intervention in the proceedings. Uh, and last but not least, as this is the last meeting that uh, Margareta Kine Nielen is uh, chairing uh, in this uh, committee, because she leaves the presidency, I would like to just say danke, thank you, merci <laughs> to Margareta. As you all know, Margareta is a steamroller. Uh, she doesn't take no for an answer. She's uh, worked very well uh, with us in this assembly. And uh, my personal experience with her is that when she's determined to push forward an issue that she really cares about, uh, she will not stop in front of anything. And it's been a pleasure to serve you, Margareta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General. Our rapporteur is asking for the floor. You have it. Madam Chair, thank you very much for your cooperation and all your uh, attention all this time. And I hope that you remain together with us in the next time and to participate also in our initiatives. Thank you again, and I appreciate the, uh, the whole work for you. Thank you very much, dear Kyriakos. We have spent many days together up to the front line of Ukraine, not yet beyond the front line in the Donbass. That has to happen very soon. Please, Ukraine delegation, support us. That has to happen that this, these committee officers do go via Ukraine soil over to Luhansk and Donetsk. And I, it's my turn to thank you all, colleagues, for the very good, very, very strong, very direct cooperation which we could have in the meetings. And I thank my vice chair, Michael Link, for his support, I thank you, Kyriakos. Uh, we have become an almost uh, unbeatable uh, duo infernale force. And, and I thank the Secretariat, namely Andreas Baker, who has supported us in all the difficult matters, and all the officers of Secretariat in all the various functions. I've always had very fast and good support. And also, Mr. Secretary General, you have been of most support to me in uh, administrative matters, but also in the very uh, delicate political human rights issues. Uh, before I close the meeting, um, dear colleagues, uh, there is the invitation by the German Bundestag now at 13.30, uh, and this is open to all, as I'm informed by Mrs. Barnett, this is open to all, and my last recommendation uh, before I close, when, when we vote, when we elect the new presidency, I recommend you to elect a person who belongs to a country and a parliament which is party to the Normandy format, and I recommend you to vote for a candidate who is committed to the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I thank you, and the meeting is closed. <laughs>